Our guest today is Dr. Michael Mastrohalis. He is a board certified urologist and practices at West Virginia University Thomas Memorial Hospital. It's a pleasure having you with us. Thank you for having me on. Our topic is prostate disease. And so, first of all, tell us what a urologist is and what he does. A urologist is a doctor who goes to medical school. After graduation, they do a urology residency where they learn the conditions of the kidneys, ureters, bladder, prostate, and penis, the testicles. They learn how to medically treat and surgically treat conditions of the urinary system in those organs. So those items that you mentioned are all the urinary system, the urology system. That's correct. Okay, our topic today is prostate disease. So you mentioned it as being a function of the urinary tract, but what does it do and what's its purpose? The prostate gland is an organ that is a sexual organ that contributes fluid in the ejaculate to help support the sperm, to encourage fertilization, and to make a child. Now, why does the prostate cause disease, and how does that happen? As men get older, the prostate gland starts to respond to testosterone and testosterone-like hormones. Enlargement begins roughly at mid-30s to end of the third decade. And as the prostate gland enlarges, as this testosterone level in the prostate gland rises, the prostate gland enlarges and can cause a slowing or narrowing of the urine flow through the urethra. Okay, now you mentioned the testosterone, the main male hormone. So that hormone is making the bladder get bigger? The hormone present inside the prostate gland, uh -huh. the cells of the prostate gland, will undergo a conversion to a more potent and stronger version of testosterone called dihydrotestosterone. This dihydrotestosterone can have a growth effect on the cells and tissues of the prostate gland. Does that also affect uh, your manly features and your growth and all of that? Testosterone does affect the more masculine features. Um, the testosterone that is located inside the tissues of the prostate gland have a greater response to testosterone and its hormonal cousins. And this is what encourages that growth later in life. So as a male, you need this testosterone. That's correct. Okay. So you had some slides, I believe, that you were going to show on this. Um, but I'm hearing that the prostate gland, and we're talking about prostate disease, is a necessary gland and or it can cause problems for us. As we get older, this prostate gland becomes less useful for making a child and becomes more cumbersome as men age. Cumbersome, that's interesting. Do I know it's getting cumbersome? You may notice it's becoming cumbersome. Uh, if you notice that your stream is slowing, you might notice that your urine stream is not as robust, that you may not empty out your bladder fully. You may use the restroom more frequently in the daytime and nighttime. You may notice that you have to return to the restroom more quickly. You may notice some straining with urination. These can be signs of an enlarged prostate gland and incomplete bladder emptying. Well, we just showed those slides that you were talking about. That's interesting. So uh, as it gets larger, which it seems it has to be if you're a male, does every male have prostatic disease? As men head into their 70s and 80s, roughly 80% 80 of them have what we call benign prostate enlargement, also known as BPH. This prostate enlargement does not represent a cancer or a malignancy but the natural growth and enlargement of the prostate gland, approximately 80% of men have this by age 80. Well, if this is happening though, and they're having, or I'm having urinary symptoms, don't they have to rule out cancer? You do. Uh, prostate cancer, unfortunately, 
is largely asymptomatic, which means no one has symptoms of prostate cancer when it comes to urination. Prostate cancer oftentimes is detected using methods of a PSA blood test, our digital rectal exam, or an MRI of the prostate gland. Prostate cancer is only very, very rarely manifested with difficulties with urination. If I remember right now, I'm going way back now here, Michael. If they did an autopsy on every man who passed away, an, an older man, a certain number of them would have prostatic cancer. That's correct. But it never causes them a big problem, so they don't do regular or, or surgery on a prostate necessarily for cancer. That's correct. So as men get towards age 80 and 85, Watch we, know from, <laughs> we know from autopsy studies that those men, about 85% of the time, have what's referred to as a very low-grade, low-risk prostate cancer. Asymptomatic. Asymptomatic. And those men are safely observed. Those men, it's said, often die with that low-grade prostate cancer, not from that low-grade prostate cancer. Some might. It, Some might. That would be unusual. it's not that common. It's not. Not, not like it, breast <clears throat> cancer, this type of thing. That's correct. Okay. So I'm, I'm having trouble urinating. Uh, and it's painful sometimes getting started. And some nights I may stay sitting on the utensils, the, the <laughs> stool, uh, for hours trying to urinate. And it is painful. I come to you and describe this to you. Where do you go from there? After we have our discussion, I would examine you. I would examine the penis, examine the prostate gland, and then oftentimes we will do what's called a bladder scan, and that bladder scan is to detect how much extra urine is left behind after a urination. That bladder scan can clue us in to how much excess urine is left behind, after a urination. That will then dictate our next steps, which can also include what's called a cystoscopy, which is a look inside the urethra and prostate gland to examine for any other competing causes for the difficulties, including scar tissue in the urethra, a stone, prostate enlargement, bladder blockage. These are things that we can find that can also be causes of those types of difficult symptoms you described. There are bladder cancers, or I remember like <clears throat> uh, one of my family was, they used to have a little hemorrhage or something, they used to have to go in and cauterize these blood vessels or something. Mm -hmm. What is that? So in patients who have bulky or large volume bladder cancers, this can also block the outlet of the bladder and can mimic those obstructive symptoms that we oftentimes attribute to enlarged prostate. This is why a urinalysis, an exam, and a cystoscopy are important before the diagnosis of prostatism or enlarged prostate is made. What's the average production of urine per minute with a normal kidney function? A normal kidney function, you can make, you oftentimes will make a bolus of urine. You, can, you might make between three and five milliliters of urine. A teaspoon? Maybe a little less, but yes. A little less. Wow. Okay. Now, what are the common symptoms other than having trouble urinating? Enlargement of the prostate gland typically will manifest with these difficult urinary symptoms. Uh, there are times whenever men will oftentimes just present to the emergency department suddenly being unable to urinate. Yes. That would be a less common but we do see that where men were peeing fine on a Wednesday, they come into the emergency department Wednesday night unable to urinate, the emergency department uh, examines them, and oftentimes a urinary catheter is placed in the bladder to relieve that blockage. <laughs> I'm laughing. I've been there. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, you don't know when it's going to happen. You could be just fine, and it can be instantaneous. Um, so you've, you've, I'm having trouble. I've been to the emergency room. They had to catheterize me and got 1,500 cc's of urine. So you know something's wrong. 1,500 cc's is a very full bladder. Oh, we gosh. would expect this to have been worsening over the course of several years. Right. We worry that with 
a volume that size that the bladder has become stretched and remodeled, that can be a sign of a secondary symptom and can lead to bladder dysfunction as the result of long-standing prostate blockage. But the main problem with the prostate disease is that it's going to get large and it's going to have trouble squeezing the urethra so that I can't pee. That's correct. And oftentimes if that blockage becomes so severe you find yourself in the emergency department with 1500 cc's in the bladder but there are cases where that excess urine and pressure is transmitted up the ureters back to the kidneys causing kidney swelling, kidney dysfunction, and loss of proper kidney function. Wow. That, that condition is more of the severe cases that we see and patients can be admitted to the hospital due to the swelling of the kidneys. A catheter is placed which promptly relieves the excess urine and waste products and can improve kidney function almost immediately. All right, so we know I have the problem. I know it. You now know it. So what do you do if I'm having urinary problems and can't pee on a regular basis? We try to assess the severity of symptoms, mild, moderate, and severe. We take that into account to your level of bother, how bothered you are by those symptoms. We add in the excess urinary volume that is left behind from the bladder scan, and we can offer several options for treatment. Sometimes the symptoms are so mild and the workup doesn't re reveal any worrisome findings. In those instances, lifestyle modifications and observation may be appropriate. Sometimes patients are content with that where they've ruled out anything worrisome and mm -hmm. they would like to observe these symptoms. If, if the symptoms are more moderate to severe, we will initiate and discuss medical therapies. An oral medical therapy uh, can really make a dramatic improvement on these urinary symptoms and can be assessed over time to see their effectiveness. What kind of medicines are those? There's, there's usually about three classes of oral medications that we will trial. Okay. There's a class of medications called the alpha blockers. Yeah. These are medications that are commonly known as Flomax, medications known as Uroxetrol, Rapaflow, Terazos, and Hytrin. Um, these are medications that have been around for decades that are tried and true and work very well to relax the prostate open to allow a more robust urinary stream past the prostate gland. So it relaxes the prostate and the ureter? It relaxes the smooth muscle smooth that, is, muscle, that okay. is present inside the prostate gland. As a prostate gland enlarges, smooth muscle and the actual cells of the prostate gland, the fancy word is the epithelial cells, but these will proliferate. The alpha blockers do a nice job of relaxing the smooth muscle component, the dynamic component of the enlarged prostate. Well, can there be other factors that would cause me to have similar urinary problems? There are. Uh, you could have an underfunctioning bladder. If you think of the bladder and the prostate in a coordination for urination, if you squeeze the bladder weakly, you don't have much force and pressure behind that urinary stream to allow a good empty. So an underfunctioning bladder, which can be the result of neurologic dysfunction, diabetes, trauma, this can cause difficulties with an underperforming bladder. The prostate can be enlarged as we discussed. You can also have a stone in the middle of the urethral urine channel or a mass. You can also have scar tissue, which is not uncommon. That scar tissue located in the urethra would be downstream from the prostate gland, can also cause blockage signs and symptoms similar to an enlarged prostate. Let's talk about the diabetes. You mentioned that it, the prostate might get smaller with diabetes? The prostate gland would stay the same size, but with diabetes, there is a effect on the nerves to the bladder, which not only stores the urine, but is responsible for a contraction and squeeze of that urine past the prostate gland. That contraction and squeeze is negatively affected by uncontrolled diabetes. Am I missing something? Uh, a lot of diabetics have to have dialysis. Does that have anything to do with prostatic disease? The effect of the excess sugars in the bloodstream and the diabetes, their effect on the nephrons, which are the cells of the kidney, uh -huh. is a similar and related destructive process to the nerves 
that might go to the eyes for a diabetic retinopathy, yeah. more, more your line of work. The nerves that go to the bottom of the feet where doctors may check the sensation to the bottom of the feet. Peripheral neuropathy. Or the nerves that go to the bladder, which become negatively infect, affected and therefore don't provide the signaling for a strong, healthy squeeze of the bladder to allow a thorough emptying. Interesting. So uh, a lot of diabetics, do they have more problems with the prostate itself than the average? Not necessarily with the prostate itself, but it can cause a more complex clinical scenario because now you're dealing with the effects of the diabetes on the bladder and an enlarged prostate. So you might have two similarly related issues going on. You might have an underperforming bladder due to the diabetes and an enlarged prostate due to aging. So now you've got two competing issues that may be contributing to those bothersome urinary symptoms. Wow. So, all right, diabetes. What other problems might cause similar urinary symptoms other than benign prostatic hypertrophy? I've met men who have scar tissue and narrowing of the tip of the penis called meatal stenosis. We spoke about a urethral mass or urethral scarring. We spoke about the prostate enlargement. Sadly, when men undergo prostate procedures, such as a prostate removal or prostate intervention for enlarged prostate, any time you intervene in the penis or the urethra can predispose a man to scar tissue. That scar tissue, when it narrows down, can narrow down the urethra similarly to an enlarged prostate, resulting in symptoms similar to the ones that we've discussed. So when somebody has that, do they frequently or, or routinely go in and dilate their urethra? That's one option. One option is a uh, dilation in your urologist's office. Yeah. Another option is where we teach patients how to self-dilate at home. There are some options where we will do surgery or a procedure to open up that scar tissue. And in severe cases, we will excise and remove that scar tissue and take a donor graft from the inside of the mouth on lay into the urethral urine channel to reestablish a healthy urinary channel. Sometimes we use oral tissue to work on the eye, mm -hmm. so the mouth is very, uh, very helpful. It serves <laughs> as a great donor site for reconstruction in the urology world. Got a question now. We talked about all these medicines that you can use to mm -hmm. help me. Do I take those medicines for a lifetime? Are they always effective? If one isn't, do you try another? What do you do? An alpha blocker like we talked about, we discussed Flomax and Rapaflow as being very popular. These medications are trialed and a reassessment is typically made in four to 12 weeks. If the symptoms have improved and the patient is happy, we tend to keep those for a medium to longer term. But I do meet men where those medications don't work. It's reasonable to trial a different medication because what works for you may not work for me. Or you may have experienced side effects of a medication where we may switch to either another medication or another class of medication. Another example would be what's called the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and that's a fancy word for finasteride and dutasteride. And these medications will shrink the prostate gland physically over the course of four to six months. Oh, so okay. we've got two options. We can relax the prostate open, or we can shrink it smaller. And a common strategy is to use them in combination so they can get a synergistic effect both a relaxation and a shrinking. Unfortunately, the shrinkage takes about four to seven months, so it's not an immediate fix. Whereas the alpha blockers or a daily Cialis might provide you with a uh, quicker improvement in symptoms. When you get to that point, do you discuss with the patient, well, we can keep this up and it'll take a few months to get you where we want you, or you can have surgery? We do have that discussion. If the medications have not worked, and we may have tried a second medication or a different class, or patients don't want to take medications altogether, we do discuss procedural and surgical options. Okay, so what are the surgical procedures? Historically, the gold standard has been what's called the TERP. The uh, dated term might be a rotor rooter where a urologist would <laughs> take the patient to the operating mm -hmm. room, doze them asleep, or do them awake under a spinal anesthetic, gently insert a small telescope through the urethral urine channel, and shave out that enlargement, 
reestablishing a healthy open channel, allowing relief of that blockage. That procedure uh, usually involves an overnight stay in the hospital. Now that's been the gold standard for over 50 years. Procedures have come around since then. You have to watch the urethra when you're doing that. What can, what can be the side effects or the damage caused by a prostatic surgery? Prostatic surgery can result in damage to the sexual nerves, which allow for a man's potency. Mm -hmm. it, having that rotor rooter procedure or the TERP, the transurethral section of a prostate gland, can result in a loss of ejaculate, which some men find troublesome. The prostate removal... Well, they, excuse me, they could still have an injection, they just can't ejaculate. That's correct. They still have an and orgasm, they, uh -huh. but no fluid is released. Okay, go right um, ahead now. The prostate gland surgery could be done improperly, and damage can be done to the sexual nerves and to the urinary control sphincter, which is responsible for a man's continence or a man's dryness. It would appear, with as many of these things that are done, it's not necessarily the surgeon or how he's doing it, these are things that could be side effects even in a normal procedure. If the procedure is done perfectly, there's still a risk yes. always. And that risk is just under 1% that the procedure is done perfectly, but these complications do happen anytime you operate. Now sometimes some fellows will have more than one TUR or that trans uh, radial, or what's, what's mm -hmm. the other one? There are men who can have a laser enucleation of the prostate gland where a laser is used to ablate and open up and shell out the prostate gland. Mm -hmm. There are men who can have what's called an aqua ablation where hot steam is pulsed into the prostate gland to boil it, cook it, and kill it. There's a procedure that, <laughs> there's a procedure that I do that is called a Eurolift where instruments are put in and instead of shaving and cutting, instead of boiling, or removing, staples are used to staple open the prostate gland in a brief procedure, reestablishing an open channel, as we can see on my illustration. What's that called? That's called the Eurolift. The Eurolift. So you staple inside the prostate. That's correct. So you stretch that or staple it back so the urethra can come through and the urine can come through. That's correct. The procedure itself takes about 12 to 15 minutes in properly selected men. It works as well as a transurethral resection, a TERP, and it can provide men with immediate symptomatic relief. Wow. And oftentimes these men are able to be brought off their medications, which makes them happier. You said staple. Is this a metal staple? It is. It's a clip. It's, it's a stainless steel clip that is applied and that stapling procedure is cinched down to squish the prostate gland narrow to reestablish that patency. And uh, so they're stainless steel, they don't rust, but can they come out? That would be unusual. Do uh, so you have to sometimes go in and do more of stapling? I have provided second consultation on patients who've come to see me after an unsuccessful procedure and sometimes a second Eurolift may be appropriate. Sometimes you progress to something like a transurethral TERP or a laser enucleation as what's called a salvage procedure, or a secondary procedure to finally bring a close to this man's condition. Well, that's very important because a lot of these things you're talking about, their average private doctor, uh, private physician, or their cardiac specialist or something might not be up to date on those things. There's constant changes. So that's amazing. How long has that procedure been around? Uh, around 10 years or so. We've oh got, my goodness. We've got some very good uh, five and 10 year data that supports this use and its effectiveness and its longevity. How many clips do you put in? On average, you may put in between two and six on average, depending on the man's prostate gland, depending on his anatomy. And properly selected men who have been examined in the office, they'll undergo a cystoscopy, which is a visual inspection of the urinary system. Oftentimes we will measure the prostate gland with an ultrasound or an MRI. We take into account the patient's symptoms, the findings on cystoscopy, the size of the prostate gland on imaging, 
And if they're a good candidate for Eurolift, I can often tell how many clips or staples I'll need to reestablish patency. On average, I probably put between four and six clips. That's done under general anesthesia. I will oftentimes do it under a twilight where we don't even use any wow. sort of intubation. It's a twilight like you might experience during a colonoscopy. We could even do it under a spinal, which the, where the patient is awake and we do a spinal anesthetic similar to an epidural. Next question, if a patient has had a TUR before, can you still use the uplift procedure a second time? Yes, you can. Uh, if that procedure from the TERP has been allowed to heal and you re-scope them and examine them and they're found to still have obstruction and blockage that you feel is contributing to these urinary difficulties, yes, you can do a Urolift and clip and staple open the excess residual or the regrowth of that prostate gland to reestablish an opening. Now, do all urologists do this? I know some urologists specialize in certain things. Not all urologists do these. I'm the first urologist to offer this procedure here in Charleston. Oh. This procedure, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> my pleasure. I, I brought this procedure with me from St. Louis where I did my training. Uh, this procedure has been effective and the confidence I have in it allows me to offer it regularly. And at Thomas, I've probably done approximately 10 since I started in July. Well, very quickly, what are the advantages of the Eurolift? The Eurolift is a procedure that allows you to spare your sexual fluid, which means you can open up the blockage without sacrificing the ejaculation component of the orgasm. It's also brief. You can go home the same day. You often don't need a catheter, and the results are immediate. And when, uh, how long are you in the hospital? You stay for the procedure, and you're discharged the same day to the care of your loved ones back home. What are the long-term results? They're very good. What we can see is that men almost immediately can demonstrate a more effective urinary stream and we can get them off their oral medications in two to four weeks post-procedure. Now, um, does insurance cover this? It does. Insurance covers it. Uh, the insurance company would like to see that a patient has failed oral medications and wants to confirm that the proper investigation has been performed in the office by your urologist. That's amazing compared to what I have sort of been through the last 86 years. But that, that sounds really great for the average fellow. I want to thank you for bringing this information to our audience and being on Vital Signs. This is Dr. Rashid, hoping you'll see a bright light.